we call upon the presence of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of personal, private, silent confession to our God. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue in worship by reading responsibly Psalm 14, which can be found in the front of your hymnal or right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 14, read responsibly by verse. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous." You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion, when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, as it was the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, defend your church from all false teaching and error that your faithful people may confess you to be the only true God and rejoice in your good gifts of life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 19, and can be found on page 590 of your Pew Bible. Isaiah 29, starting with verse 11. And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that was sealed, when men gave it to one who could read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, it is sealed. And when they gave the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and the fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will do wonderful things for this people with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, who, I mean, you who hide deep from the Lord, your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us, and you turn things upside down, shall the potter be regarded as a clay, 
that the thing made should say of its maker, did he not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the, in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, and can be found in page 978 of your Pew Bible. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself a savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing that might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Uh, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from, from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We now profess together our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue in worship with hymn number 589, Speak, O Lord, Your Servant Listens. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you know what a chrismon is? It's something that, I see some hands going up, right? All right, so a chrismon, for those of you who don't know, at Christmas time, you'll often see in Lutheran churches especially, but among other Protestants as well, a Christmas tree that has ornaments that usually are like needlepoint or something like that, but uh, they tend to be a lot of symbols of the church. Uh, the key row is just like a P and an X, right? A couple of other things. Um, they're typically white and gold, um, and they probably have been around for a couple decades, and they're often placed in a prominent place within the church. It's a Christmas decoration, a Christmas tradition. And I've been at churches that, that People mandate, oh, like the chrismon tree has to be in a prominent, well-displayed place because that's just the way that it's done. Well, what if I told you that chrismons were invented in 1957 in Danville, Virginia, by a woman who goes by Frances Kipps Spencer. She sat in her church 
and she thought that the multicolored lights on their church's Christmas tree were a bit too garish to honor God. And so she decided that white and gold was the way to go. And she went to all the churches in the area. She must have been very charismatic because a lot of churches bought in. And, and now, actually, uh, that church that's there in Danville, Virginia, still kind of runs, I guess you could say, a ministry uh, that sells chrismons or sells patterns for chrismons. Chrismons, by the way, is trademarked for what it's worth. Uh, but I think it's interesting that this tradition that I grew up seeing, thinking that it was this like time-honored, hundreds-year-old tradition, has only been around since 1957 because one woman thought, you know, multicolored a bit too much. And so in light of our gospel reading, I say light, you know, Christmas, that whole thing. Uh, but in light of our gospel reading, I thought about some of the traditions that you might see within the Christian faith. Not just within the church, but within the Christian faith and how sometimes our interpretation or our understanding of those traditions uh, can lead to some problems. But before I go into that, let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here today for this chance to worship you, for this chance to join together with this fellowship of believers. Lord, I thank you for the chance to share your message. I pray that you speak during this time. I submit myself to you, and I pray that all who hear this message, that they would be willing to do the same. I trust that your Holy Spirit is at work, speaking, proclaiming truth, proclaiming love, proclaiming the gospel. Speak, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I do want to say a special welcome to those of you joining online. Thank you so much. If you're watching just the sermon, uh, you feel free to share that. If you're watching the entire service, especially live, uh, please feel free to share that via Facebook. That's our modern form of evangelism. Uh, now, I say that. I say that pretty much every week that I'm here, and perhaps some of you are a little weirded out or perhaps even tired of me saying it. Well, here's the deal. When it comes to evangelism, perhaps you in your mind conjures up uh, going door to door, knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, we've got a church service. We'd love to invite you just here in the neighborhood. That is certainly one form of evangelism. Another would be just talking to close friends, right? People that you know, people that you care about and saying, hey, I go to church every Sunday. I'd love for you to join me. Uh, perhaps you're more uh, kind of that type that would go to the street corner and give out Bible tracts. Here you go. Do you know your Lord and Savior? And those are all forms of evangelism, to be sure. Uh, but in this day and age, online is another way to do that. By sharing via social media, you're hitting all three of those, those things that I just described. And I think that kind of goes in line with what we're talking about today, recognizing that sometimes culture changes and shifts. And, and while we keep the spirit of what evangelism is, of what it means to share our faith, what it means to share the gospel, the method by which you do that sometimes does change. Now, if you can think back to Pentecost Sunday, I talked uh, about some similar topics on Pentecost. I talked about how we shouldn't put God in a box, if you remember that. Uh, because in that particular message, I was talking about how the Holy Spirit, right, this, the mystical person of the Trinity, the one that, that we as Lutherans have the hardest time with because we tend to be logical people and saying like, okay, the Holy Spirit, like, okay, God the Father, we get it. Jesus, oh yeah, we're all about that. But Holy Spirit, like, uh, and so I talked about not putting God in a box. But part of that message was also talking about the traditions that we have in the church, talking about the church as an institution, as an organization, that quite frankly, we often put God in this box and say that you experience God from 8.15 to 9.15 on Sunday morning or 10.45 to 11.45 on Sunday morning. But God is so much bigger than that. God is so much bigger than the confined traditions that we tend to put him in. But perhaps I should have saved that talk on, uh, on empty traditions for this Sunday. Because here's Jesus in our gospel reading talking basically about that, about the empty traditions that he experienced in his time, in that culture, in that society. Now, in our gospel reading, we see Jesus squaring off with the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, yet again, right? It seems to happen a lot. And in fact, it does happen a lot because throughout Jesus's ministry, there's kind of a pattern 
to the way things go, right? He arrives at a place and he goes and he teaches a little bit and, and it makes the religious leaders mad so they confront him and he has to defend himself and he explains what he's doing and then eventually he has to go back to his disciples and explain his explanation because they were just all confused. And then after that, typically he goes out into the town that he's in and starts healing, starts performing miracles, starts showing compassion to the people that are kind of the outcasts of society, to the people that, to be frank, the religious leaders said, you're not worthy, right? And then eventually, the, because of what he's been doing, because of what he's been teaching, he gains more followers. More people say, this guy is something special. And then he goes on to the next town, rinse and repeat. This is basically from age 30 to 33. That's what Jesus' life was all about, going from town to town and doing this kind of cycle of things. Now, in this particular instance, our, our gospel reading today, the issue that the religious leaders bring up is this uh, washing of hands, right? Now, in this particular setting in our Earth's history, washing of hands seems like a great thing, right? We see defiled hands, we're like, uh-oh, defiled hands, Ooh, I don't know about that. But it's important to recognize the context of what's talking about here is uh, it's ritual washing of hands. It's not just like, you know, taking 20 seconds and singing a little song and getting all the scrub in between your fingers and that kind of thing, right? There's a ritual to it. There's, there's almost a, well, there is a religious implication. It's essentially kosher law is kind of what they're referencing here. I'm reminded of a story that my father-in-law told me. He knew somebody who worked at a salt factory, a kosher salt. And there was a, a particular day where the snow was too much. This was up in Minnesota. And the rabbi couldn't come in to bless the salt for the kosher salt. True story. And so he called them, and they held the phone out over the vat of salt, and he said the blessing from wherever he was, right? Because that was the tradition. That was the ritual cleansing, the ritual thing that had to happen in order to do this. So that's what he's talking about, is this ritual washing that had been created, that had been added. Now, Jesus calls out this essentially empty tradition. And in fact, it's nice because he quotes our Old Testament reading. Did you catch it? He quotes our reading from Isaiah, which is always nice when the lectionary does that for us. Um, but essentially, here, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it real quick. What he quotes is, um, he says, because this people draw near with their mouth, and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. In other words, they're having this outward expression, this outward tradition of, of making a show of washing their hands. But what's in their heart? I'm reminded again of a story. This is something that happened to me. I was at lunch with a pastor uh, and he, as the, the server came and dropped off the food. She started to walk away. He flagged her back down. He said, hey, 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 come back. And it was actually kind, kind of awkwardly rude, but he like flagged her back down. And she, she, oh yes, yeah, well, is something wrong? He said, no, 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 we're about to pray for our meal. Is there anything that I can pray for in your life? And, and she said, oh, and he said, oh, and by the way, what's your name? So she gave a little prayer request and she gave her name. Um, he then, she walked away. He prayed for it, but he didn't actually pray for her request. And he said the wrong name. And then later on, he, he got mad at her because there was something wrong with the meal. And I was like, what are you, what are you communicating to this young lady right now? What, like, you're trying to make this show of praying for you, but you didn't actually pay attention to a prayer request, and you forgot her name. You honor with your lips, but in your heart, who do you know? What are you about? What is she at least getting the communication from? It's interesting, by the way, uh, that bit about uh, at the very end where it says, um, oh, flipped it around again. It says, their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Now here in the Lutheran church, uh, how many of us went through confirmation, hands in the air? How many of us learned what does this mean that we should fear and love the Lord, right? Isn't it interesting that the fear of God is something that's literally become a commandment taught by men? See, I think sometimes we talk about respect of God. We talk about the fear of the Lord. We talk about, because that's what the, it means with the fear of the Lord. Not like fear like, Ugh, but fear like we respect you. We honor you. We recognize the power and supremacy of God. That's what that means. But when it becomes something that you memorize via rote memorization, is it really in your heart? When it becomes something that's just taught, this is what you should do, 
rather than explaining why, rather than saying what that means, rather than showing what it means in life, rather than modeling it through our lives. And see, we lose sight of something when we get from this is what a Christian does to this is what a Christian should do. And there is a subtle difference there when we start to teach things as commandments. See, Jesus is calling out the empty public praise. But it's interesting because the Pharisees and the scribes that were there are probably thinking, hold on, what he's calling out are legitimate Old Testament laws. This whole ritual washing of hands, that's, that's actual law that comes from the Old Testament. It's actually found Exodus chapter 30, chapter 40, and then Leviticus chapter 20. It talks about the washing of hands, the process by which you do that. Now, it is of note that the law more applies to Levitical priests than everybody. But you can totally see the religious leaders saying, well, if it's good enough for the priests, then it's good enough for everybody, right? Because that's what they did. They took simple laws and said, okay, what kind of framework can we build around it so that we are sure that everybody's as righteous as they could be? That's how they got from, from 10 commandments to hundreds of commandments, right? And so while these are actual laws in the books, it's kind of interesting because Jesus... Jesus is essentially saying, okay, those laws that you learned as scribes, as the ones responsible for accounting those laws, that you were responsible for teaching those laws, yeah, they don't matter anymore. And I'm sure that just completely threw them for a loop, but I think it's important to note what comes later in that section. It says, this is, again, from Mark chapter 7. We, our verse ended, at, or our reading ended at verse 13. And many such things you do. Jesus goes on to say, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about this parable. He said to them, then are you also without understanding again? It's like Jesus explains himself and the disciples are like, can you explain that to me like I'm a five-year-old disciple maybe, right? So he says, uh, what, you don't understand this? Uh, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? And, and it has this little parenthetical. Thus he declared all foods clean. And just that one fail swoop, kosher law wiped away. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, because they're probably still sitting there thinking, okay, so like there's no such thing as food poisoning? I'm really confused by this, Jesus. But he continues. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Jesus is calling out that these Pharisees, these religious leaders, are so focused on these laws, particularly the ones pertaining to eating, pertaining to washing your hands, these very public ritual outside laws, that they're not paying attention to who they are are, how they portray themselves, how they live their lives. Essentially, he's saying you're focused so much on the letter of the law that you're missing out on the spirit of the law, because those original laws were written so that the nation of Israel be set apart from the pagan nations around them, so that the people of God, the ones who descended from Moses and from Abram and all that, that they would be set apart as different, as other apart from the rest of the world. Now, society had changed, but the issue was they were still not focusing on what it meant to be a follower of God. They were focused so much on the letter of law. How do we make sure that we don't break these? We're going to build all these rules and all these should nots around this one particular rule. You see this actually in the sports world. The NFL, if you're a football fan, boy, they cannot define what a catch is. Right? They constantly are going through and trying to fix the rules about what it means that somebody catches a football, which if you're not a football fan, you're like, well, that seems dumb because that's pretty obvious when you catch a football. But according to them, like if your toe is so much on the line, it's not a catch. Doesn't matter if you're wearing slightly bigger cleats and it's not your actual toe. Doesn't matter if the guy painting the field sneezed at that particular moment. 
and the line was one inch that way. It doesn't matter. If your toe is touching the line, not a catch. But everybody looking is going, yeah, it is. See, they are so focused on the letter of the law that they're missing out on the spirit of the law. Now, luckily, I suppose, for us, there's a bit of a case study in our readings when it comes to this. Our epistle reading. Oh, you thought I was going to skip it. You thought I was going to chicken out and not talk about the wives submit to your husbands bit. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right. So this whole idea of wives submit to your husband. And I mean, when I approach this, I, rather than telling you kind of my interpretation of things or how I've been taught this, um, I'm going to present for you some various things, right? Some various facts, some things to consider that perhaps you're unaware of. Partly because in our Old Testament reading, it says the wisdom from wise men perish, right? So you're, it's about your relationship with God. So wives submit to your husbands. That's how it starts off. And perhaps you think you know what that means. It certainly seems brides know what that means because never once in all the weddings I've ever done has a wife, a bride, ever requested this verse. Ever. <laughs> And I've done a lot of weddings. I used to live in St. Pete, Florida, and I've done a lot of beach weddings. And never once I was like, can we, you do the one about wives submit to your husbands? Instead, it's like, if you do that one, so help me, I will walk away, right? So they seem to understand. Maybe perhaps you think you understand what it means. But let's think about this, this idea of submission. And, and I think that we also, before we even get there, Let's look at the obvious, but you've probably heard other pastors talk about, because there's that whole paragraph about wives submit to your husbands, but then the following paragraph, oh, that's crucial, because it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, and how did Christ love the church? Oh, he just died for us. He gave of himself everything he had so that we could be set free. That's the love that Christ had for the church. That's the love that husbands are meant to have for their wives. That seems like a pretty big charge. You've probably heard other preachers talk about that. But this idea of submit, what does that mean? How do we define submit? Well, it's submission, if you break the word down, sub, under, mission. Under the mission of your husband as to the Lord. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So you are under the mission of your husband as to the Lord. You're under the mission that God has for your marriage. You're under the mission that God has for you as a couple, as a family. You're under the mission of God in what you do. Submit, submission, right? as to the Lord, and that doesn't mean that as to the Lord, doesn't mean that you're supposed to submit in the same way that you submit to the Lord. That's not what as to the Lord means. It's easy to interpret it that way, right? Submit to your husband just like you would submit to God, because those are very different things, and unfortunately, there have been a lot of husbands who interpreted it that way, who said, no, 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 you're supposed to, you're supposed to honor me like God himself. Oh, buddy. <laughs> Boy, have you got the wrong interpretation of that. As to the Lord means you're submitting to your husband as you submit to the Lord. You are honoring God by submitting to your husband, by following along in that mission that you share together, right? So that as to the Lord bit is actually about how you are ultimately honoring God and what you do. You're under the mission that God has given to your marriage, to your Christian life. It's also important to note, because we started our epistle reading at verse 22, how did verse 21 go? Christians submit to one another in all things. All Christians submit to one another. That is the previous verse. That is the verse that actually continues this thought, right? And so this mutual submission of all believers, assuming that your marriage is not unequally yoked, you are to submit to one another. Interesting, okay. Hmm. Now it's also noteworthy, and this one you probably didn't know, the word submit isn't found in verse 22. It's also not found in verse 24, if you look at the reading. Verse 22, wives submit to your husband. That word submit is not there in many early texts that they have. There's some debate about that, but it's interesting that it's not there. It's implied. It's assumed. Worth noting. It's also not there in verse 24, where it again says, wives, submit to your husbands. That word submit is implied or assumed in many readings and many texts that they have. Again, they have lots of different Greek texts, so that's noteworthy. Hmm. Also, um, we see sometimes this notion, 
where this verse connects back to the Timothy verse that says, I do not permit women to have authority over man. Uh, Culturally, it's worth noting that Timothy, young Timothy, who Paul had put into place to to be the the head of that church, uh, was preaching in Ephesus. Ephesus was the cultural hub for a cult towards Artemis, the Greek goddess. And Artemis, of note, in Ephesus, had the largest group of priestesses, female pagan priests. And so Ephesus, in many ways, became sort of a matriarchal society. And so it might be noteworthy, and again, it doesn't explicitly state this, but it might be noteworthy that Timothy, young Timothy, who's called out and said, do not look down on, them, on you because you are young, that he says, don't let these women who are in pagan priestess positions overpower you. Perhaps he's speaking to the culture there. Again, I'm just putting facts out there. It's also worth noting, who is this letter to? Ephesus. So when it comes to this idea of wives submitting to your husbands, it's very easy to look at that verse and say, this is what this means. It means the husband is the Lord of the household. It means he can say whatever he wants, do whatever he wants, and she has to follow him to the letter of the law. But when we take that that traditional understanding and don't actually look at what scripture says, don't actually evaluate what the Bible is talking about, don't actually say, okay, what is all there? Perhaps we use that text to justify some terrible sinful behavior. Unfortunately, that text has been used to justify abuse and manipulation, has been used to justify broken relationships. See, it's important for us to look at something apart from tradition. To say, okay, this is the traditional understanding of it. What is it actually saying? What is it actually all about? That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying it's not about the washing of the hands and the ritualness and and all that. It's not about whether you eat the right thing or eat the wrong thing. It's about who you are. It's about what's inside, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, inspiring you to live a sanctified life, a better Christian life. It's not about your salvation. Your salvation is based on nothing that you do. Your salvation is based solely on what he did for you. That's justification. You are justified through Christ alone. But your sanctification, that lifelong process of becoming a better Christian, a better person who follows God, well, that's where you just, we strive to be better people. And maybe you can get caught up in the weeds of what that looks like. You can get caught up and say, "Uh, what do I need to do in this situation? How do I respond to God in this? But ultimately, it comes down to respect. It comes down to respecting who God is, living, not just understanding, but living that love of God. As you approach all things saying, God, how can I honor you in this? It's the same thing when it comes back to that conversation in Ephesians about marriage. It's about husband and wife saying, how can I honor you in this? How can I be someone who is seeking to find uh, what is right for you, for our marriage, for the mission that God has given to us in marriage? We have a challenge as Christians or as followers of Christ. We have a challenge, yes, to recognize that we are forgiven, that we are justified through what he did for us on the cross, but also then to take that, that freedom, that love that we have, that forgiveness, that new life through Jesus Christ, to take that and become sanctified, that process of trying to be better people here on this earth. It comes back to what Jesus is talking about. What is what comes from within? What is at your core? Are you seeking to be a better person? Are you following the ways of this world and trying to to bow to that? Are you trying to to please others? Are you trying to be more pious and, and let people know how holy you are? I go to church every Sunday, but I'm terrible Monday through Saturday. Or are you somebody who rather than seeking these empty traditions, rather than trying to fulfill this this empty life, you seek the fulfillment of the one true God who inspires us, who the Holy Spirit challenges to be sanctified, to be made more and more holy. Are we seeking to fulfill with empty traditions or to fulfill with a God whose love never fades, who never changes, 
who is beyond all things. Yes, we live in a changing world, but we serve a God who is true, who is changeless, and who above all else offers us love, forgiveness, grace, and hope that we can then offer to others. My brothers and sisters in Christ, may we, rather than chasing the empty traditions, rather than trying to find fulfillment in the brokenness of this world, trying to find fulfillment in the rules that mankind has created and said, this is the way that you should live. Instead, let us live to please the almighty, all-powerful God, recognizing that we are set free from our sin and given new life, new life that should reflect him in all that we do and everything that comes from within. Amen? Amen. And now if you'll please join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you would draw us ever on, that you would help us to to recognize that which we have made versus that which you have made. The expectations that we place upon ourselves, upon the church, upon other believers, but then instead the expectations that you have for us. Inspire us, Lord, to be better people. Not for our own edification, not so we can pat ourselves on the back, but instead so that others would look and be inspired by us, just as we are inspired by you. Help us to reflect your love and your light in this darkness. Help us to be, as we talked about last week, Lord, to be children of the light. Lord, draw us ever on towards you, leaving behind the brokenness of this world. And Lord, because we live in this broken world that that we continually break through our sin, there are those who need prayers, who who have things going on in this life, who are feeling the effects, uh, the repercussions of that brokenness. And so we raise them up to you here now. We pray for Austin and Rosemary, for Harlan and Wanda, for Bill, Donna, Jennifer, for Mike, Norma, Carolyn, Joanne, John, Ruth, Bill, Atlas, for Sue and for Skip. Lord, we pray that you are with all of them. You know what's going on in their lives, and we ask that you would inspire them, that you would be comfort them, that you would be present in their lives in a real and powerful way. Lord, let that be true for all of us, to see that you are with us and that you will not forsake us, that as we go through the difficult times, the storms of this life, that your light is upon us. And Lord, as as I offer those prayers up to you, I know that there are other prayers. I know that there are other things on the hearts of the people here in this room, people watching online, the families and friends in our lives. And as you walked on this earth, you taught us a prayer that says it all. And so here now in this place, joining together as well online, we offer that very prayer to you, praying together one voice, one family of believers, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to continue in worship here now with the gathering of our offerings, what we offer back to God. It's not about you and the church. It's not about you. It's about the blessings that God has put into your life that you can give back so that we can continue with ministry. Those of you joining online, um, we can't really pass the plate to you, but there is a way to give online, uh, and that's there in the comments. You can also find it on our website as well. We would encourage you to give online. We also would encourage you to find a local church. If you're here local, come join us. We'd love to have you here um, as you feel comfortable. But if you're not local, find a local church to be connected with because the church is about a family of believers. With that said, we continue now in worship.